Hey everybody, about a week ago on Dr. Peter Atia's podcast, The Drive, Dr. Atia and Derek from More Plates, More Dates really got into the weeds about the FDA's ban on peptide compounding, TRT, post-cycle therapy, folistatin gene therapy, and a lot of really interesting topics. It was a really cool conversation. I admire both of them highly. Derek, without any sort of medical degree or medical background for that matter, especially does more research on peptides than the doctors of YouTube. And it's pretty cool we see eye to eye on most things in this space. Let's take a look at the conversation they had because it truly is fascinating. Really quickly though, we recently surpassed 1,500 subscribers, which is really cool because I don't know if you've taken a look at my earlier videos, but for the most part, they're quite boring. And it's awesome to see others out there value learning about the research that has been conducted on peptides. If you haven't already, if you like these videos and want to see more like them, hit that subscribe button, give us a like, a share. It would be a peptide pipe dream to one day gain the attention of the likes of Derek and Dr. Atia, and dare I say, interact with either of them at some point. But hey, I digress, a small peptide YouTuber can have dreams too, right? Let's get into the video. When we last spoke, we talked about a whole bunch of peptides. Mm -hmm. And so, just recently, meaning after we spoke, but before yeah, this discussion, <laughs> yeah, yeah, the FDA came out and took a list of about 30 peptides and put them on a list called Category 2. Now, this included six of the peptides we discussed, including BPC-157 and, um, uh, what is it, CJC? CJC-1295, yeah. uh, Ipamorelin. That's right. So a bunch of the things we talked about. That's right. And it's important to note that we've made some videos on this topic, too. Not only which peptides of popular use have made this list, but also some of the reasons why in comparison to others which have gained FDA approval, which we'll get into in a little bit are now on this category two list. And I've been doing my best to understand what that means. My interpretation of what it means to be category two is they, these can't be sold. Compounding pharmacies cannot make them. And any interstate commerce of these things is a felony. Um, that said, I've noticed that there are still sites selling these peptides and they seem to be suggesting that they're selling them for research purposes, which is clearly bullshit. Mm -hmm. um, is, what's your understanding of this FDA ruling? I think that the ruling has basically put them on a like a super high risk list, essentially, whereby they're not outright banned, but you will invite heavy scrutiny and perhaps legal action should you decide to make them. Yeah, so as Derek is touching on, the list categorically and as a whole is pretty ambiguous. 503A Category 2 is outlined as those, quote, bulk drug substances that raise significant safety concerns, unquote. And the question Peter and Derek are trying to answer is, what does that mean? But from the people I've talked to in the compounding world, people who even are in the business of selling peptides, they seem to think it's, I don't know, the commonality that I'm seeing is it is very risky. It was already risky to begin with, but it's very risky and you are inviting scrutiny, but it's not necessarily actually illegal. I see. So... And this is an interesting point because as two people who operate healthcare companies, essentially, their interpretation is a bit different than the commoners like you and me. A lot of people speaking out on YouTube against this ban, if you will, will come from a place of how do I get people on these peptides now? Which is fair, but I think the best question to answer is now that they're on this category too, how does money get shuttled into researching these peptides so we better know their risks and benefits in the future? So... The rationale for putting these 30 peptides on this category two list uh, that provided by the FDI is, is it's a safety question, right? So the question was, um, we don't have, you know, sufficient data on the safety of these things. So we're going to, we're going to sort of schedule them in a way. Um, was there anything else to it? I mean, is, 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 is there any reason to believe that these things were, were harmful or, you, you know, I, I guess I just don't really understand um, what the what the rationale was. And I'm, by the way, I'm not saying I necessarily disagree with it. I just I'm trying to understand what what's being communicated in this ruling with respect to these peptides. I think publicly what they're saying is it's a safety concern and there's no actual FDA approval to justify the uh, production of these and prescription of them, which is not 
the most unreasonable conclusion, I suppose, given that a lot of these are research chemicals at the end of the day. Like, it's not like Melanotan 2 has a, you know, application right now for somebody who's too white, you know? So it's uh, some of this stuff is very, you know, fudged at the end of the day anyways with compounds that got abandoned in the middle of a pipeline, but people had a demand for it, so... The research chemical companies have never stopped selling it and then compounding pharmacies the ones that are willing to risk it for the biscuit will you know make a certain amounts and in, in quantities that they deem is uh you know enough to satisfy the perceived demand but not enough to get whack-a-mold potentially so yeah it's it's really weird because you would think it'd be black and white you don't make it or you make it illegally and that's kind of it and i think a lot of people do believe that it's gray area enough that it is still legal to make and there are small compound compounding pharmacies that are going to do business as usual so most of their discussion on the topic surrounds how companies are still getting away with selling these peptides and the whack-a-mole they're referring to is that when so many producers exist the government has more trouble essentially hitting them in the head getting rid of them and they do both say they find ideologic benefit in use of some of these from cjc 1295 to bpc 157 and we've discussed what they are and how they work ad nauseum, and so no need to regurgitate that in this video. But they do highlight that they are in a gray zone, and that's pretty unique in my opinion. Peptides find themselves in this pretty nebulous area that's neither black nor white with regards to benefit and safety. And if we take a look at the FDA's outlined concerns, the safety risks for most of them are copied and pasted, as in their pretty identical. For instance, many have opposed risk for, and I quote, immunogenicity for certain routes of administration and may have complexities with regard to peptide-related impurities and API characterization. APIs are active pharmaceutical ingredients, and immunogenicity is essentially an ability to formulate an immune response. So what the FDA is, in my opinion, saying is that we don't think it's safe because, one, the research hasn't indicated long-term effects of these compounds, and two, it's possible they're impure or may contain an ingredient or series of ingredients that can provoke a deleterious immune response. The document goes on to say, quote, FDA has identified no or only limited safety-related information for proposed routes of administration. Thus, we lack sufficient information to know whether the drug would cause harm when administered to humans, end quote. And now you can see, according to the FDA's dialogue, why this is gray. In so many words, the FDA says, I don't know how these drugs work, but we have concerns. And this is essentially what Derek says. It's not entirely a bad thing since with all of these compounding pharmacies, we really don't know what we're getting. Tests indicating legitimacy could be fudged, the bacteriostatic water we're provided may not indeed be bacteriostatic, and heck, the BPC-157 we're getting may just be ground up sugar or worse. There is no regulation, which therein lies the catch-22. As I see it, we're in a bit of a pickle here. The FDA is saying we need research, but in this document published this past September pretty much says we can't get the research we need, which is odd because Sermoralin was FDA approved at some point, yet Tessamoralin, which is structurally similar as a GHRH analog, is, is approved for management of lipodystrophy in those suffering from HIV. In theory, a lot of these peptides are similar and likely share similar risks and benefits. However, due to their underground and unclear methods of compounding, the FDA doesn't feel safe granting their free-for-all production, which is understandable. But, all in all, I think we need research. And preventing research is not the way to get it. There's likely a big financial iceberg sitting at the bottom of this dilemma. It's why no Novo Nordisk picked up semaglutide, for instance. And I'm so tempted to say that unless the FDA has a big change of heart, Big Pharma won't dive into these peptides to further evaluate them, which is a shame. But I'm hopeful some money or public interest will find its way to the likes of BPC-157 and CJC-1295 and maybe even reopen the doors for Samoralin's use in other facets. As the only way to achieve a safety profile is research, and the only way to achieve research is funding, and the only way to achieve funding is money. So that's where I stand. That said, here's a quick re-overview of this topic with regards to FDA's regulation of peptides and what placement on this 503A category 2 list means. I hope you found this video helpful. If you did, just hit us with a subscribe, a like. If you didn't, you can dislike, public outcry, whatever it is you want. Regardless, I hope you have a great day. You take care.